G'day folks, my name's Peter Hobson, I'm the Superintendent Minister here at Albert Street Uniting Church, Wesley Mission, Queensland. Welcome to our online service. If you're visiting with us from Townsville, from Western Australia, from Victoria, from overseas, or if you're one of our regular congregation members here in Brisbane. Just a reminder that today's service is also a communion service, so if you haven't already done so, can you please take this time to prepare a table before you? You need to have the elements of a, a bread and a cup, uh, and, and it'd be good for you to cover them with a cloth as you begin the service, and then when we come to communion, you can take that cloth over the, off the elements and partake of the service as it is led from here. You may also like to set up your table with some other images that you would find in a church. So you might like to have, for example, a, a cross on the table, or perhaps even a photo of people from the congregation where you would normally have worship. Um, set up that table so it, is, it represents a sacred space and indeed a sacred time together as we enjoy this time of worship and the time of communion. Please enjoy the service. Let us come to worship together filled with hope and wonder. Let us come to worship today filled with the expectation of God's presence. Let us come to worship together knowing that we are justified by faith and shaped by love. Help us to be people who grow together through our suffering, learning to endure. And through our endurance together, may we become the people God has called us to be, the body of Christ. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. We give you thanks, Creator God, for the land on which we meet. From time beyond our reckoning, the traditional custodians of this land, the Jagera and the Turbal people, have lived in harmony with their environment and nurtured this land with a deep and abiding care. We give thanks for their stewardship and pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. We also give thanks for the multitudes who have recently arrived here from many different cultures and countries, and who now call this place home. Help us, O oh God, to live together in fellowship, to share our stories of hope and justice and peace, and to further the work of reconciliation in this land. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Welcome, friends, to our online service. You'll notice that the colours of today's service have changed. We are now entered into what the church calls ordinary time, and so you'll see the colour green featured uh, in this season of our worshipping life together. Today's service is a precursor of a new preaching series that we will begin on June the 28th called Seasons of Grace. And this series will examine the life and ministry of the Apostle Paul as we travel through the lectionary readings in the book of Romans. The book of Romans is a great place to start when trying to understand some of the implications of the good news of the kingdom of God for first century communities. And of course, it has great relevance for us today. Paul's letter to the fledgling Christian community in Rome covers his theological understanding of such issues as sin, and grace, and how he imagines life in the Spirit. Some of the language can be a bit dense at times, and Paul's style of rhetoric is based on a literary genre that is long forgotten in our contemporary world, but the basic ingredients are all there. And so from June the 28th, we shall begin a 12-week journey through Romans as guided by the lectionary. My hope and prayer is that will help shape our understanding of God and of the community that we call church. Today is also the first day that we are gathering together in homes here in Queensland as COVID-19 restrictions ease. Some of you will be meeting with others to experience worship together, to pray together, to share fellowship together and to break bread together. Some of you will still be watching this service on your own and that's okay. Wherever you are watching this and whoever is there with you, know that it is the Holy Spirit who gathers us in, enlivens our faith and sends us out into the world as witnesses to the coming kingdom of God. May God be with you and also with you. Of our God and King, lift 
up your voice and with us sing Alleluia, Alleluia The burning sun with golden beam The silver moon with softer gleam Oh, praise Him, oh Blessings on our way. Oh, praise Him. Alleluia. The flowers and fruits that in thee grow, let them His glory also show. Bless and worship him in. 
We light the Christ candle to remind us that Jesus is the light of the world and in him there is no darkness. Let's join together in our prayer of adoration and confession. Gracious God, the psalmist declares that you have given human beings dominion over the works of your hands. All too often, however, we confuse this holy charge with having ownership. We then treat your creation as a resource to be used for our needs and our profit. We find ourselves reluctant to count the cost of our failure to be your faithful stewards until disaster strikes. And so we pray, show us another way, O oh God. Show us another way. Holy God, your cry for wisdom and understanding. In our homes, our workplaces, our schools and universities, our churches and places of worship, our parliaments and our courtrooms. We confess that we don't always want to hear that cry and we don't always like what this means for us and what it reveals to us. Instead, we fall back on old familiar habits, comfortable assumptions and quick conclusions. We ask you to show us another way, O oh God. Show us another way. Merciful God, the Apostle Paul proclaims peace, hope and grace are your gifts to us. And yet there are times when grief overwhelms us, anxiety holds us captive and pain and fear and anger leave us numb with despair. Indeed, sometimes we find ourselves wondering how and even if you are at work in our lives. And we long for you to show us another way, O oh God. Show us another way. We bring to you our silent prayers of confession. Sisters and brothers, hear the good news, news that seems too good to be true. God continually shows us another way. God's mercy is as wide as the oceans. God's desire to forgive is as strong as the mighty wind. So let your hearts receive the outpouring of God's love through the Holy Spirit. By the grace of God found in Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. May the peace of the Lord be always with you and also with you. Just a few quick announcements just to let everyone know what's happening in the life of our community. Of course, restrictions are starting to ease, which some of us are really welcoming and others of us are a little bit cautious about. That's okay. Even as restrictions ease, we need to maintain our distancing, we need to maintain good hygiene and please phone one another up each day uh, just to let everyone know that they are loved and cared for. Please follow us on Instagram and Facebook and our social media posts. And please, if you'd like to be a part of our community, send us your details, your phone number, your address, your email address, so that we can include you in our uh, weekly mail-outs. Last week, during our service, we announced that Wesley Mission Queensland was launching its Reconciliation Action Plan. And it's very telling, of course, that over this last week, here in Brisbane and indeed around the world, there's been a protest movement called Black Lives Matter that has brought to the attention of many of us some of the inequity and injustice that our system has perpetuated towards people of colour. Indeed, right out the front of our doorsteps here in the church, 30,000 people gathered in King George Square. I grant you there wasn't too much social distancing uh, happening at that point, 
but it was a great opportunity for voices to be heard that have been silenced for too long. And we're going to be talking about this concept of Black Lives Matter a little bit later in the service during the sermon. So well done to all of those who are able to participate in that protest movement and as part of our Reconciliation Action Plan, we need to have our eyes open and our ears open to look for ways that we can engage in the process of reconciliation in the communities that we're a part of. We'd encourage you, of course, to continue giving to churches. Whatever church community you belong to, there are many opportunities to give even if we don't gather together in the one place on a Sunday morning. Our bank account details are available through our church office and I would encourage you to take the time to give during the week so the good work of the church may continue even during this time of COVID-19 restrictions. The path ahead as restrictions ease is becoming a little clearer for us and our hope at this point if you're here at Albert Street United Church in Brisbane, is that from July the 12th, we'll be able to gather here at Albert Street United Church. There'll be restrictions in place as to how we do that. And that is becoming clearer for us as time goes on. So for those of you who are planning to be here on July the 12th, we will send out instructions as to what that will look like. It won't be how church used to be but it will be an opportunity for us to be in the one location to gather as the people of God and to celebrate what it means to be the body of Christ. There'll be some who choose not to come to church uh, at Albert Street on that day, and that is okay too. We're going to continue to film our service, and you will see that online as you are watching it even now. And just a reminder that from July 12th onwards, it will only be the 9 a.m. service that happens on the Sunday. On June the 21st, so next Sunday, we're not filming a service here at Albert Street. Instead, we'll be using a worship service that the Queensland Synod produces as part of a celebration for the the anniversary of the Uniting Church in Australia. So the June 21 service will be produced by the Queensland Synod and we would encourage you to follow the links that we send in our email and to watch that service when you would normally watch ours. Today's scripture reading is from the letter to the Romans, chapter 5, verses 1 to 8. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character and character produces hope and hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. For while we are still weak at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed rarely will anyone die for a righteous person though perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we still were sinners, Christ died for us. The second reading today is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapters 9, verse 35, through to chapter 10, verse 8. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in the synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Then Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, a tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon the Cananean, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. 
as you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without payment, give without payment. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Loving God, by the power of your Holy Spirit, be present here as I speak and be present wherever it is that we are listening. May there be more of you and less of me in the things that I say. And may we be, be transformed by the power of your Holy Spirit, by the power of your love at work in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As I indicated at the beginning of our service, as we enter into what the church calls ordinary time, we're preparing ourselves for a 12-week preaching series looking at the life of, of the Apostle Paul as we journey through the lectionary readings we find in the book of Romans. This preaching series is going to be called Seasons of Grace. And what we want to do today, by looking at this passage that comes to us from Romans chapter 5, is a bit of a, a prelude as to what we're going to experience over those 12 weeks. And this passage before us, from Romans chapter 5, is a great glimpse, just in a few verses, of who this person Paul is. The journey that they were on as a person, and the communities that they journeyed with. So we find in these few verses, some key words that Paul brings to us, words like grace and what that means for his understanding of, of faith. And there are some other key words like suffering and endurance and hope. And we see with these words a description of who Paul is as a person, the experiences he has gone through that helped shape his understanding of God. And for the 12 weeks of our series, we're these words will have greater significance for us as we look at some of the doctrines of the Christian faith and how church is understood as a community that becomes the body of Christ. But before we enter into some of the descriptions that this, these few verses give to us, I want to share a story with you. There was a guy who was in a car traveling down a country road and alongside of him he sees a little bit of a mini dust storm. It's keeping pace with the car that he's in. And he, he looks out the window and he realizes that he's being chased by a chicken. How can a chicken be traveling at 60 kilometers an hour, he thinks. And he looks a little bit close and he realizes the chicken has three legs. He thinks, wow, a three-legged chicken. Well, let's just see how this chicken moves, shall we? So he increases his speed up to 80 kilometers an hour and sure enough, the chicken keeps pace. He goes up to 100 kilometers an hour on this back road in the country and this three-legged chicken not only keeps up but starts to overtake and then all of a sudden darts down this country lane. The man in the car has to squeal on the brakes, does a U-turn and follows the chicken up the country path. The chicken is almost like dust in the, back, in the foreground but then goes into a farmyard. And so the man in the car can't help but follow and finds himself in the, in the farmyard 
of, of a farm that has three-legged chickens. They're running everywhere. He sees them. They're scooting here. They're scooting there. They're so fast, he can hardly, his eyes can hardly follow them. And sure enough, the farmer comes out to greet the car. And the man says to him, I've just seen all these incredible three-legged chickens. Where, where do they come from? And the farmer says, oh, I breed them here. We breed three-legged chickens, and they are so fast. They just scoot around the place. The man looks at him and he says, three-legged chicken? Why would you breed a three-legged chicken? And the farmer says, well, I don't know about you, but I, I like a drumstick when it, at dinner time. I love a good drumstick. And the man says, well, yeah, I love one too. It so happens that my partner loves a good drumstick as well. I'm married and my partner loves a good drumstick. I love a good drumstick. The man in the car says, yeah, I'm, I'm married too. My partner loves a drumstick. I love a drumstick. And he says, well, the, the thing is, we sometimes like to have people over for dinner. And our guest inevitably likes a good drumstick too. And the man in the car says, yeah, I can see that. And so the farmer says, so we decide to breed a three-legged chicken so I could have a drumstick, my partner could have a drumstick, and our guest could have a drumstick. And the man in the car is just nodding and smiling. That's a fantastic idea. A three-legged drumstick, a three-legged chicken. So there's three drumsticks, one for you, one for your partner, one for your guest. That's amazing. What do they taste like? And the farmer says, well, if we can ever catch one, I'll let you know. There's a sense here that the idea of a three-legged chicken that can provide three drumsticks is almost too good to be true. If we can ever catch one, we could know what they taste like. For some of us, this is almost a description of what religion looks like, of what faith looks like, perhaps even what our relationship with God looks like. It's something beyond our reach, something we can't actually take hold of because it's just too fast for us. It's just, just beyond the, bounds, the boundaries of our own desire, our own ability. The Apostle Paul writes in a context that is sometimes similar to this, that people understood God as something that was beyond their understanding and recognition and experience. And there's much of the Christian faith that would testify to this. But Paul wants to say something different alongside of this, to say God is also closer than we could ever imagine. And our best theology should not keep God at a distance, but draw God close. And there is a challenge here for us to engage with. So when Paul uses words like justification, he's not wanting to use a term that keeps God at a distance. He's wanting to use a term that brings God close. When I first became a Christian, I found the language of the church that I was a part of used words like justification and sanctification and other words that I'd never heard used in everyday speech. And I found it hard to understand what was being spoken about. This word justified is often thought of as a legal term because of its association with the word justice and the way we think of justice today. There's an image on your screen now that is often used as, as the personification of justice and we have this phrase in our Western world that justice is blind. In other words, justice does not have favourites. Everyone is equal before a notion of justice. But this is not the biblical understanding of justice at all. In the Old Testament, the, the Hebrew Bible, the Jewish people had a very clear understanding that God does have favourites. The Jewish people were God's favourites. God had chosen the Jewish people and blessed the Jewish people that they might be a blessing to others. In the New Testament, the, the, the Christian faith describes God's relationship with people differently. Through the words of Jesus, we come to understand that God's favourites are no longer the Jewish people, but rather the poor, the lost, the lame, the blind, the sinner, the tax collector, the prostitute. Jesus says uh, a doctor does not come for those who are healthy but for those who are sick. It seems that God, God has favourites and shows favour towards those who are broken and lost and are in need of healing and help. So this notion of blind justice is certainly not one that we will find in Scripture. So what does it look like then to understand that God 
has favour towards some people rather than others. And for those of us who do not consider ourselves blind or lost or broken, perhaps that's a hard concept for us to get our heads around. I once heard a preacher uh, put this word justification into these words. To be justified is to be just as if I'd never sinned. And that was an understanding that, that I I could come to grips with. This idea of being justified is being made right with God. That God, when God looked at me, God did not see someone um, who was separate from God because of sin, but rather someone who was welcomed into the heart of God because of the power of God's love. This idea of justice then is not so much about law, but about relationship. In fact, in the language of the New Testament, the word for justice and the word for righteousness are the same word, dikaiosune, and it is all about relationship. To be in right relationship with God, to be in right relationship with one another, was to be justified. And to be in right relationship is to surrender to the love that binds us together. It turns out that The God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament is not bound by the law, but rather uh, bound by this idea of love as the great experiment of inclusion, a love that would bind people together, regardless of of their history, regardless of what their, their present might be, the hope that there might be a future they might share together. To be justified is to be just as if I'd never sinned towards God, just as if I'd never sinned towards my sister or my brother. To be justified is to be reconciled, to understand ourselves as a community of God, as one people, a community that demonstrates the love of God for the world to see. So, with this in mind, I have some questions for you. Are you comfortable with the idea that God has favourites? How does it make you feel? Do you think the way you feel about this might differ if you were poor or lost or broken or a sinner? Do you think much about sin? Do you think of yourself as a sinful person? And if sin is that which diminishes our right relationship with God and our right relationships with others, does this challenge your idea of what is sinful and what isn't? Spend some time thinking about these questions with the people that you're watching this video with. Or if you're by yourself, you may like to call someone or perhaps even journal your thoughts and responses to these questions. Take some time to do that now. Paul moves on from this idea of justification and being justified by faith to talk about this notion of grace. And if we find that justified is a Christianese term, more so and more problematic is this idea of grace. What does grace actually mean? Grace, if we understand it properly, is actually not just about um, feeling good about one another. It's not always a notion that is welcomed. Grace, understood properly, can also be offensive. Because along with this idea of justification... Grace means that we often find ourselves in the company of people we don't like, the company of people who may have injured us, the company of people who we may have injured ourselves. The inclusion of grace means that we are often called to walk alongside people who are very different to ourselves. Now, if we want to understand what this grace might look like, we get a bit of a hint in a phrase that Paul uses in this text called, the the phrase in the Greek language is described with these three words, the love of God. And we find this in Romans chapter 5, verse 5. Love of God in the original Greek language has this ambiguity around it, just as it does in the English language. When we say the love of God, we can think of that in terms of the objective genitive or the subjective genitive. And the difference is this, the love of God can mean God's love for us or the love of God can mean our love for God. To understand Paul's notion of grace, we're challenged to think that both of these meanings go together. 
In other words, it is because of God's love for us through the power of the Holy Spirit that we are able to have love for others. There's a challenge here that Paul gives to us that we are to think of love already in the world. God's love for the world has permeated everywhere. There is no place that we will go that God's love has not gone before. But that love is also an invitation. So God's love goes into the world, God's love is poured into our hearts that we might have love to show for others, that we might have love to give to others, that we might have love that empowers others. So this understanding of grace then is almost, almost becomes like the air that we breathe. There is no place that we will go that there is not already air waiting for us, just like it is the love of God. And this is hard for us to understand, that God's love could be in places that seem broken, that seem, that seem filled with pain, that seem filled with loss. But there's a challenge for us to think that God's love is in the midst of the places where pain exists, looking for healing, looking for justice, and there is an invitation for us to follow, to participate in what God is already doing. So the author Philip Yancey says that this idea of grace might be hard for us to understand, but we're not asked to understand it. We're not asked to comprehend it, we're asked to convey grace, we're asked to live grace. That's what it means to be the body of Christ. Which brings us to the notion of hope. Paul's understanding of hope is not some pie-in-the-sky fantasy, it's actually concrete, it's about lived experience. And in this text in Romans 5, we see what that looks like for Paul. The hope that Paul has is one that comes from the character that has formed in his life, and that character is one that has formed through the endurance that he has experienced through the suffering that has come his way. And as we look through Paul's life, we see this time and time again. Suffering produces endurance, produces character, produces hope. So in this time post-COVID-19, what hope has arisen for us from our experiences that we've shared together, that you've shared in isolation? Are you hoping things will go back to the way they were or are you hoping for something different? How have you changed over the last few months during this time of isolation and how will these changes in you bring change to our church community when we join together once more in public worship? I want you to reflect on these questions. So I mentioned at the beginning of our service and in our announcement time about the protest movement called Black Lives Matter. And over this last few weeks, we've seen protest movements overseas and here in Australia where people have gathered around this slogan, Black Lives Matter. And there has been some pushback. Some people have found this this slogan, this protest, very hard to connect with because often the cry that comes back in response, and maybe you're familiar with this, is when people say black lives matter, often the response they hear is all lives matter. Um, can I please encourage you not to do that? And there's a, there's a significant reason why. And it comes down to our understanding of justification. It comes down to our understanding of grace. I want you to imagine that you're a pedestrian on the street and you see someone get hit by a car and an ambulance has to come and pick them up and take the, the emergency services, take the body out of the car, they're injured, they're in need of help, they put them in an ambulance and they're taken to hospital. At that point, if you're someone, a pedestrian, who has seen this happen and you call out, why don't I get to ride in the ambulance, you'll have an understanding of what it is to cry back, all lives matter. Black lives matter is not, does not suggest only Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter is a protest against a system that has caused injury and injustice to people of colour. We don't need to say all lives matter. That's like being that pedestrian who says, why don't I get to ride in the ambulance? It's a recognition that God has favourites, that Jesus has come for the broken and the lost, not for those who are well and those who are whole. For those of us who find the slogan, Black Lives Matter, difficult, that's what the good news of Jesus Christ looks like. It's often difficult for us to hear. 
especially for those of us who live with a life of privilege and well-being. It's difficult for us to understand that sometimes we are part of the problem. But this is the offence of grace. And that is what is so amazing about God's love. To be justified with one another, to be justified with God, it's, it's to understand that when God looks at us, it's just as if black lives matter. It's just as if the broken and the lost and those who've experienced injustice are welcomed into the heart of God and the divine embrace of God's love. And it's just as if, as a church, we are called to share that love with those in most need. Let us pray. God, thank you that your love transforms us and challenges us and remakes us anew. Help us to look for ways to engage with this idea of justice, this idea of grace, this idea of all-conquering love that you have for us, that we might see justice abound, flowing like a river, and that we might be justified in right relationship with you and with one another. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Folks, we've come to our part of the service now where we're going to share communion together. If you have not already done so, can you please prepare a table before you that includes a cup and a plate? And if you have that table before you, now is the time to uncover the elements.
let us join together in the service of Holy Communion. May the Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. The meal before us is an ancient one and it is also one that we are yet to join. This meal before us remembers a past beyond our own memories and also anticipates a future in the kingdom to come. This meal before us is one we are sharing in different locations and at different times as we watch this video and yet it is a meal that we share together by the power of the Holy Spirit. This meal remembers that last meal that Jesus shared with his disciples and this meal remembers a promise to come where there is a great banquet where all are invited and none go hang hungry. On that last meal that Jesus shared with his disciples, he took a piece of bread and I'd ask you to take a piece of bread at your location and he broke it and he blessed it and he shared it with his friends and he said, this is my body broken for you, do this in remembrance of me. At your location, please break the bread as I have done. And then after the meal, he took a cup and he shared it with his friends and he blessed it. And he said, this is the cup of a new covenant, my blood, indeed, my love and my life poured out for you. Please do this in remembrance of me. And if you are at home at this time, I'd ask you to please take the cup and as a sign to those who are gathered, hold it as I am doing now. As Jesus broke the bread and placed the cup, he said a blessing over them, these elements, and so too we say a blessing here today. Let us pray. God, by the power of your Holy Spirit, come upon this bread and upon this cup, that they may become for us not just elements on a table, but living signs of your love present to us. That in the broken bread, we would experience your brokenness in a broken world. And we would understand the call that you've placed upon our lives to bring healing to those in need. And as we take this cup that has been poured out for others, May we understand and experience your love poured out for us. And may we understand and hear your call to us that we might pour out our love towards others. May we meet with you in this meal and know that in the, the dream and the endeavor of the kingdom, we are not alone. Instead, as we celebrate Holy Communion, we realize that we are one with you and one with one another as the body of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let us say together the words on the screen as we find in Holy Scripture, this prayer and of praise and blessing. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. As we gather around this table, we do as our Saviour commands and we celebrate the redemption that he has won for us. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. I invite you now to serve one another, the body and the cup. At this point, can you please serve one another the bread? The body of Christ, broken for you. And now we serve one another the cup the blood of Christ poured out for you.
Let us pray. We give thanks, O God, that we may taste of your goodness, that your love and your grace, your justice and your peace are not like some three-legged chicken that's out of our reach, but rather come to us in this meal as we share together your love for the world. As we go from this table, may we commit our lives to act with justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly before you. In the name of Christ, amen. Let us come together for our prayers of intercession. Let us pray. We thank you, O God, that you have given us an enduring hope. We thank you that in ways beyond our understanding, you come to us. You love us. You renew us. You transform us by your grace. Lord, hear our prayer. Pray for the nations of the world that continue to experience such tragedy and heartache due to COVID-19. For families and communities that have known illness and suffering and death, we pray for healing. We pray for comfort. We pray for your care. We pray for compassion and wisdom for leaders having to make difficult decisions weighing up the concern for those at most risk with the challenges of economic recovery. Lord, hear our prayer. Pray for the people of the United States of America, for communities torn apart due to systemic racism and injustice, for communities where democratic protest has escalated into widespread violence, for communities where fear and anger have eroded trust in government, for communities that are not sure where healing and hope will come from. And in doing so, we look to the injustices in our own country where Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples continue to experience institutional racism and injustice. In the midst of this desperate need, help us to tell a different story. Indeed, help us to live a different story. Help us to listen to those who've experienced racism. Help us to learn how we can do things differently. Help us to change our behaviour and our institutions. Lord, hear our prayer.
pray for our community here at Albert Street. We pray for healing and for unity. We pray that we will grow in our capacity to care for one another, even as we are isolated and dispersed due to COVID-19. We pray for our elders, for our church council, for our church staff, and for our ministry team. May we continue to lead and to serve with wisdom and with grace. Lord, hear our prayer. ask all this of you, O God, knowing that you are our hope and our salvation, a very present help in times of trouble, and the one whose purpose is to grant new and abundant life to us all, and indeed to our world. And so we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. this time of isolation, may the continuing presence of God's love fill our lives with wonder and with joy. By the power of the Holy Spirit, help us, O God, to choose life in all of its fullness, the way of love and hope and peace and justice, the way of Christ. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, called for songs of loudest praise. Jesus sought me when I 
stranger wandering from the fold of God. He to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood. Seal it for thy courts above. 